So tonight we'll talk about interest rates. I'm sure you've heard of interest rates before, um, but just we'll start from scratch and we'll just say if you were to borrow some money today, um, the amount of money you might borrow today, right now, would be what we'll call the principal. Well, the principal will say is P. And let's say you were to pay back this money at some point in the future. So we want to calculate how much money you would pay back in the future. And there'd be a rate associated with what you're paying. So one year from today, you might owe the principal plus some fee, some amount times the principal. So it's not a fixed amount. It's not like if you borrow a dollar, you have to pay ten dollars plus the original dollar. And if you borrow a million dollars, you have to pay ten dollars. It's not like that. It's a percentage of the amount of money that you borrow. So one year from today, you would owe whatever the principal is plus a rate times the principal. So for example, if you borrowed a hundred dollars today, you might owe 100 plus, let's say the rate was 5%. I'll probably use 5% a lot because it's an easy number to use. But you might owe $100 plus 5% of $100, which is $5. So you might owe $105 a year from today. And if you don't pay uh, a year from today and we wanted to keep that same rate going, um, this, after a second year, you would owe what you owed at the end of the first year, and then this formula would start to become inductive. So this now represents, let's say in that example, $105. We would then take the $105 plus the rate times $105 is what you would owe at the end of the second year if we maintain the same rate year after year. And then obviously the formula would be a little bit different. If you started making payments along the way, how much you would owe later would be reduced. But if you weren't making any payments, this would be a formula for us. So if we wanted to clean up this formula, because you can see year after year this is going to start getting messy, it starts to look like this. Right now, here's your principal. One year from now would be the principal times 1 plus the rate. So this would be like 1.05 times the principal. And then the 1.05, it starts compounding year after year. It would just be 1.05 squared. So 1.05 squared is uh, 1.1025. This starts to have compounding. And then we just go on and on. And then for any given year, we could just raise the 1 plus the rate to the power of n for the number of years it goes through. So this would be, again, this, the type of, let's say, a loan where you borrow an amount of money, you make no payments along the way, and then it, at some point later on in time, we're trying to calculate how much money you'd have to pay. So R would end up at representing the interest rate in this case. So this introduces the concept of like present value and future value. So, and we can calculate the present value from the future value and the future value from the present value. So the future value of some money uh, would be equal to whatever the present value of the money times 1 plus the interest rate. Now, this is a case where we're going to make um, payments along the way. So it's not going to be just one big payment at the end. So if we wanted to know well, this is where we're compounding the interest periodically, if let's say this was tr like traditional home mortgages or car loans, you typically make a payment every month. So the, the interest rate, so anything that is a rate, first of all, what is, what is by definition a rate? Like, uh, if, you, if you had to define a rate, what would it be? Yeah? Um, I'd say like, like amount of something divided by like, like a time interval. Or right. It's an amount divided by a time. So like 10 gallons of water per minute, let's say there's a flood going on, that's a rate. It's an amount divided by time. So a rate is going to be some amount divided by a period of time. And we'll always quote the rate in years. So we'll reserve the letter R to be for years. But if somebody's making payments every month, you still have the idea of an annual rate, even though they're making payments along the way. So if they're going to make payments along the way, and n is going to be the number of interest payments per year, 
then the interest rate, um, the interest rate on a yearly basis divided by the number of payments, n would end up being 12 here. That would be like saying how many, uh, we, we'd be saying how many years this payment is times the number of payments per year. This exponent ends up being the number of payments that we're making. So for example, if, if we had a five-year car loan where you make, a, you make 12 payments per year once a month, there would actually be 60 payments. This would be 5 times 12 is 60. There would be 60 payments, but you're not paying, let's say the, the uh, car loan rate is 12%. That's a very high rate for cars right now, but I just want it to be easy to divide by 12. You wouldn't be paying 12% every month. You'd be paying 12 divided by 12, which is like 1% per month if you were paying a 12% loan. <clears throat> so for a car loan, for example, this might be 5 times 12 is 60, so there's 60 payments, but you're paying the annual rate divided by 12, which is a lot smaller rate. It's just, it's just um, taking the same formula we had before, but doing it now on a monthly basis. Okay, so now, that would be if we were doing, uh, the formula we had before would be if we were doing um, discrete compounding, compounding at a certain interval. If we weren't doing that, and we decided that the, in, the number of payments, instead of being like 12 per year, maybe you think, let's do 24 per year, maybe every, twice a month you do a payment. Or once a week, then it would be like 52 per year. So the interest rate keeps getting smaller and smaller and getting closer and closer to 1. But the exponent is going off into an, you know, a very high number. So there's no rule that says we have to use 12 payments per year. We could do 24 payments per year or 52 payments per year or 100 or 1,000. Or... The more payments we do, the smaller the payments are. And this starts to have a limiting uh, a limit to it. If we let n go to infinity, what are we essentially saying we're doing? We're kind of we're making payments like all the time. It would be like the, you know, the bank's going into your account and taking money out constantly, but the amount they're going to be taking out is going to be extremely small. right? So we want to get away the, the idea of your balance. Your balance doesn't change like at the beginning of the month and then it drops and then it drops again. We want it to be a perfectly smooth um, uh, payment stream. So as we let n go to infinity, we're just basically taking away the steps of your payment and we're making it perfectly smooth. So a little bit of review on limits. Um, we want to take the formula that we just had and what we're going to do here is we're going to, the, the reason why we're doing this, and you might remember this from calculus, we're going to take, we're going to introduce a new variable. M equals number of payments divided by the interest rate. And we're going to plug that into the formula we had on the last, um, the last slide. So the last slide we had R divided by N. Now if we plug that in we get 1 over M. And then in the exponent we used to have Y times N. So that would give us N if we multiply both sides by r, we get y times m times r. So we just have to make sure this uh, formula is only valid if the rate doesn't hit zero, because the zero can't be in the denominator. But this is a legitimate substitution. We're substituting in a variable m, which is equal to n divided by r. So what does that really do? It helps us to rewrite the formula in this format down here. So now we're saying the future value is equal to the present value times the limit, and actually we can move the limit as n goes to infinity inside here because there's no, the present value has, is not affected by n. So the limit as now m goes to infinity of this term, 1 plus 1 over m raised to the m, and what I've also done here is I've taken this m and put it inside the brackets and left this part outside the brackets, so I haven't really changed anything. So does anyone know why they went ahead and used this substitution? Really all we did was form what's inside this bracket. 
I don't know if it's been a while since you've seen limits or does this one ring a bell? You know how there's certain limits that are just kind of like famous limits? Like for, for example, just does everyone remember what a limit is? So a limit is basically, like let's say probably one of the easiest ones would be let's say one plus a half plus a quarter plus an eighth plus a sixteenth and this went on infinitely. What would that sequence add up to? Not two, but like close to it. Right. So the idea of a limit was that would that sequence would get closer and closer and closer to two. It would never actually hit it, but it would keep getting close to it. And sometimes the limiting value could actually hit two, but never go past it. So the idea of a limit is what's the value you will never go past, is really what we're saying. So there's some famous limits, you know, one plus one over x, and then one plus one over, you know, and as x goes to infinity, one plus one over a value raised to itself. If you let that value go off to infinity, this ends up going somewhere. So does this, what's in this bracket, does this look familiar? I'd be surprised if it did look familiar to you, but, e. wow. Does anyone else see, see that this is the number E? Where do you know that from? <laughs> uh, is this from my, my, uh, actually I'm taking actuarial exam right now. Taking what? Uh, actuarial uh, actuarial exam. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> okay, so this ends up being the number E. Um, wow, that's pretty, pretty interesting. So this is just, you know, for any number, this would be um, the limit as x goes to infinity of 1 plus 1 over x raised to the x. Uh, this calculated out to be a number. We could actually, you know, we're going to talk later on in the semester about how to use Excel. We could use Excel to approximate this thing and then keep feeding in a number to get a better number. And eventually, we'd keep getting closer and closer to this number. <clears throat> but this limit ends up being a, a particular constant. And back before computers were invented, this would be a very difficult constant to calculate. But a guy by the name of Euler calculated it. And they decided to give this constant the, no, the name E, which is really named after the guy Euler, the first letter of his last name. And he was a famous Swiss um, mathematician. And his picture's on the 10 franc, which is like the US $10 bill, I guess. So they have a picture of Euler on the Swiss 10 franc, but I guess now with the euro they got rid of all that money, so so he got <laughs> he got downgraded, I guess, unless they put him on the euros. But um, so anyway, that number that what was inside that um, parentheses ends up being a constant. So let me just go back. So this really is basically saying if what we're doing here is we're basically saying. Instead of the payments being like one, one per month or two per month or any, any, uh, any discrete interval, we've decided to let it be continuous. So really, at any point in time, we can calculate how much money you owe if you're borrowed money at a certain interest rate. You don't want to say, well, if it's on the last day of the month, I owe this month, but if it's the first day of the next month, that means I just made a payment, so my balance dropped. If you want to remove that, we can just let n go to infinity and then we can have the continuous uh, payment stream. So this formula ends up becoming this formula. So the, present uh, the future value of money that you're borrowing is the present value times this whole thing ended up just being a constant E. And it's approximately 2.71, whatever that last slide said. And then it's raised to the number of years times the interest rate. <coughs> So, for example, if you wanted to use this, um, let's say you were to borrow $100 today, and you're not making any payments along the way, and you want to know what would I owe three and a half years from now, um, and the interest rate is, let's say, 5%, it would be three and a half times 0 0.05, E raised to that number, times the $100 originally whatever that comes out to, that's what you would owe 3.5 years from now, or 3 point, you know, you could put any number of years you want in here. Any real number would be fine. 6.25 years from now, you just plug that in and you'll know exactly what you would owe at that instant. So it's calculating your interest instantaneously. So it doesn't have to be in discrete payments. <laughs> So now just applying this to some 
basic calculus we've done in the past. Let's say there was a function that said, um, let f of t equal some value p times e to the tr. So sometimes you might see in the exponent a y because it's a number of years and sometimes t meaning time. So depending on which textbook you read, you might see a y and you might see a t. Okay, so if we took the derivative of this function, f of t, what is the derivative of a constant times e to a, so the variable is time, the variable is t, so r is the constant in the exponent, t is the variable. So do you remember the derivative of e to the something, where, you know, e to the constant x, that ends up being, you need like u equals, yeah, so it, it, what it ends up being is... T times R. Mm. U like DU. So it would be like, yeah, if we said E... Um, I don't know, write one, I'll write a few examples out at the end of this. So if we said like E to the CX, because we used the X, the derivative of E raised to the CX would be E to the CX then times the derivative of the exponent, which would be C. So that it would be like a constant times e to whatever it was before. So, and then any constants along the way just get multiplied across too. So, the derivative of p times e to the t r, t is the variable, r is a constant in this case, would be the p carries along, so the p is there, the e to the t r stays, and then the derivative of the exponent, which is r, gets multiplied by the result. So this ends up being r times the original function when you take the derivative of it. Now, if you remember from calculus, the derivative is the rate of change, right? So in words, what is this saying? At any instance, the balance is changing at a rate that equals r times the current balance, which hopefully that would come out. Otherwise, we did something wrong with all that. So that's what's interesting about that number e is that if you take if you take e to the constant times x, the rate at which it changes is actually equal to what that constant is. And in this case, it would have to have come out to be r. Otherwise, we've done something wrong. Okay. So then the idea of if you were given for if you were just given examples, this is now going back into a discrete case, a discrete or continuous case actually. If you were given a present value and an interest rate, or out of, out of the three variables, the future value, the present value, and the interest rate, and the number of payments, if you were given three of those, you could calculate the fourth one from this formula. So if you wanted to get the future value from the present value, time, and rate, it would be this formula. The future value is equal to the present value times one plus the rate raised to the number of uh, the amount of time that this is going on. If you wanted to get the present value, you would just take this formula and play around with it. Take this and make this the denominator of the future value would be divided by 1 plus r raised to the n. And then if you wanted to calculate the interest rate, if you had a future value and a present value and the amount of time, and you wanted to calculate what is the implied interest rate, to get the rate from the present future value and time, we would take if, for example, we were solving for the rate here, we would take the future value, we would divide by the present value, future value divided by present value, would equal 1 plus r raised to the n. So we would take the nth root of that value, that would give us what 1 plus r is, and then we'd subtract 1 from both sides and we would get r. So these are just formulas. If you kind of, this one is probably the easiest one to remember. You're just taking your present value and tacking on interest to get the future value. Once you've memorized this one, and you don't have to do any memorizing in this class, but this one is kind of intuitive. Even if you didn't memorize it, you can kind of just come up with it and then just play around with this and you'll get the other formula. Okay, so you could imagine that be some. We could come up with some simple examples like this. Like, what would be a simple example for this one? Well, we we kind of did that on the chart we had before. Suppose, for example, the present value is a hundred dollars. If you borrowed a hundred dollars today, 
and pay, and the annual interest rate was five percent, and you paid it back two years from now. How much would you owe? It would end up being one hundred and ten dollars and twenty-five cents. I think I may even have that as an example on one of the upcoming slides. Okay, maybe I kind of left that one out because it's a little bit easier. Okay, so now let's say we had this example. Suppose somebody came up to you and said, you have two choices. You could get, you could, you have a, let's say you have a thousand dollars right now that you want to invest. And you could give a thousand dollars to one investment, which will return three thousand dollars five years from now. So let's say we don't, well, let's say right now we can't see these numbers. It'll return $3,000 five years from now. Or your other investment could be you invest $1,000, which will give you $4,000 seven years from now. Right? So you got the idea. You have $1,000 to invest. You're trying to pick the best thing to invest in. Which one would you pick? Now, the first thing we would, might want to do is use the formula from the previous slide to calculate what the interest rate is in both of these investments. So with the present value, the future value, and time, we could calculate R. So let's say we calculated these two R's. Is there a, if I was to ask you now, well, I don't even know if there is a right answer to this question, so it's kind of open for discussion. Is one of these investments better than the other and why? And you know, hopefully this discussion leads into what we'll talk about when we talk about bonds. This topic will come up again. So yeah, probably a because it gives you a higher interest rate, and after five years you can reinvest it somewhere else. And you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Well, okay. So if you were to finish that, you're you're saying uh, probably a is better, mm -hmm. but is it definitely better? So here's what you're doing. You're saying in one case you can get 21.9% for seven years. In the other case you get 24.57% for five years. Now five years from now you get this new amount of money, the $3,000. Five years from now you have to kind of shop around for something else to invest in. If you let it just sit and not gain interest, this would end up being better. But you're saying five years from now when you get your $3,000 you'll do something with it for the last two years and hopefully the interest rates five years from now, which you can't predict. Mm -hmm. If you could, you wouldn't be in this class. Yeah. Right. You don't know what the interest rates are going to be five years from now, but you're hoping they'll be enough that taking the $3,000, finding some two-year investment will do better. Doing investment A plus this new thing you're going to do five years from now will be better than investment B, but you don't know for sure. But it probably is because this rate is higher. But it's not definite. And if you're the, you know, and so is there any other discussion like why one person would it make sense that a per, some people might want A and some people might want B? What are like scenarios where someone might want A over B, and what are scenarios where someone might want B over A? Well, for example, if the person really needs the cash back in five years, he can like retirement for kind Yeah, if you're planning long term stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, if a, so, for example, if a person uh, if a person cares more about having a good rate for a longer duration, a longer period of time, they might be willing to take the slightly lower rate, knowing t time's more important to them. If you really need the money five years from now because um, you, you're going to owe somebody money five years from now, this might be a better investment. So, this question actually doesn't have a correct answer. What's the better investment? It was done. I laid out the example intentionally where one had a better rate but it didn't last as long and really depending on what your situation is might determine which one you want to uh, invest in. But one thing you do want to do is at least calculate the rate <laughs> before you start then discussing why one is better than the other. Okay, so and then just while we're still on the topic of interest, um, simple compounding is basically saying uh, the future value of money 
and periods from now, if, if the bank is like compounding, adding interest onto your account, would be basically your principal, the original amount you invested, plus the amount of money you gained from interest. And then that would be the number of payments you made times the interest rate. Um, and this ends up being true um, only if you collect interest at each period and do not reinvest the interest into something else. Compounding interest is where you're taking you, the interest you're getting and leaving that in the account, so then you start getting interest on top of interest. And that ends up being this formula, which looks very similar to the formula we went over earlier. Okay, and then just this, this topic right here, since we're on the topic of um, interest rates, I just wanted to cover this, but this doesn't really come up in our financial mathematics uh, program, but have you ever heard of these two phrases, like um, annual percentage rate and effective annual rate? If you go to get a car loan, you, sometimes you'll see two rates. Might be a little confusing. But basically what the saying is, um, let's say where M is the number of interest payments made per year, if you go to get a, if let's say you had a car loan, and I'll, I'll just use an example, it's simple, let's say we had a 12% APR, you would be paying 12 divided by 12, you'd be paying 1% every month, would get, and that would happen 12 times, that's how we would calculate what is the amount you're actually paying, um, over the year. So, for example, if you're, if you're told you have a 12% interest rate, but you're actually paying 1% per month, there is a compounding on that. So you'd actually be paying something a little bit higher than 12. And I think I have, I think I have one other example. Yeah, okay. So this is just the comparison between those two. So let's say you buy a car with an APR of 18%. And the interest rate is calculated monthly. So you take your annual rate of 18% divided by 12 months, you're paying 1.5% per month. What is your actual what what is your EAR? This ends up being, you know, 1 plus the APR divided by M, raised to the M minus 1, which ends up being 18% divided by 12 months raised to the 12, because we're doing that many payments, and what ends up happening is you're, it's actually like you're paying 19.56% per year. And the reason ends up being is if you're paying 1.5% per month interest, then you're, it starts compounding. You're paying 1.5% interest on the next month's payment. So it's effectively like the rate you're paying is 19.56 when the car dealer is actually telling you you're paying 18 percent, you're really paying like 19.56. So the only reason these two rates exist is because you're making monthly payments. If it was converted to instantaneous payments and you could pay the car dealer anytime you want along the way and they calculated it using the E number, then they would have to announce that this is your rate but they can actually make it look like you're paying a slightly lower rate because they're dividing it by 12 months. So they always, car deal is always quoted in APR. Okay, so then, yeah, the effective rate versus the nominal rate, and this is the relationship between the two. So C is the number of interest payments per payment period. So if you started making additional payments, more, more payments than the ones that are scheduled, this would be the relationship between the effective rate and the nominal rate. And like I say, this won't come up in our, in our studies. We'll be using the instantaneous rate almost all the time, but just since we're having a discussion on um, interest rates, I'd just like to be, for completeness, completeness, just cover all the different topics. So if we were asked questions, we won't really go over this in this course, but um, if you were asked to find the effective rate per quarter at a nominal rate of 18% compounded, the effective rate, if you did it quarterly, would end up being 
it's, the, it's going to be using this formula every time. So this would be 18% and you're making payments quarterly, which means four payments per year. Um, minus one, this would end up being four and a half percent. If we did it monthly, that would mean we're making, we're doing the 18% divided by 12. This three ends up being the number of payments per quarter. And there are three payments per quarter. And then we'd end up having a rate of 4.568. So the rate goes up slightly higher. And then the continuous case would end up being, um, when, when we finished our calculation, would be e to the 18% divided by 4 minus 1. And I should have calculated that out, but we just get the idea. This, but this would end up being a little bit higher than 4.56. Okay, so then there's the topic, and this kind of leads into other types of investments. There's the topic of cash flows. Now, the examples we've currently covered was typically, like for example, if you buy a car, you, buy, you borrow a ton of money and then make payments back to the car dealer, or you know, the bank, whoever you lent it from. Or you buy a house, you get one big payment and then you make payments back to them. In this case, I just wanted to mix it up where maybe you make some payments and then the thing you're investing with makes payments back to you and it goes back and forth. Suppose we had a scenario like that. So let's say, for example, we have a cash flow uh, is a stream of cash exchange between two parties following an agreed upon schedule. So let's say, for example, Mary gives Jim 300 I'm sorry, Jim gives Mary $300 today. Mary gives Jim $500 one year from now. Then Jim gives Mary $200 two years from now. From Jim's point of view, the cash flow is minus $300, positive $500, minus $200. Okay. Note that the cash, uh, this is a, a special definition. Uh, cash flow agreement where all the signs start off, if you're going by time, if you're going from present time out to the future, if they start off negative, 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 and at some point switch to positive, and it stays positive until the agreement ends, that's considered an investment. So that's de generally the definition of an investment. An investment is where you're paying money at the beginning and then you receive money at the end. If the payment stream starts mixing the sign, positive and negative, I guess the official definition for that would be a business. So for example, if you opened up a pizzeria, you originally borrow money, but then you start making money and you start paying it back, but then you might borrow a little more. If the sign changes, you're running a business. But if you start off by you giving money at the beginning and then receiving money at the end, that's the definition of an investment. Anything that has that cash flow um, rule to it would be considered an investment. <clears throat> okay, so we want to say, given if you had examples where you are given a cash flow, could be a series of positive and negative numbers, and there's no rule that it has to be an investment that the that the numbers all start off negative and then switch to positive. So suppose, for example, this is a, a simple example, um, consider the following cash flow. You pay $100 today and you receive $105 one year from today. Note, this is an investment. You are, have a negative sign at the beginning and a positive sign at the end. So technically this is an investment. What is the interest rate of this cash flow? So basically what, we're, what I'm doing is we're just trying to change the way we think about interest rates a series of positive and negative numbers over time will have an implied interest rate to them. So what would the interest rate, how would you calculate the interest rate of this cash flow? Now it happens to be a very simple one. Hopefully you see right away the, the interest rate is 5%, right? You pay $100 today, you get $105 exactly one year from now. That's 5% per year. But if you didn't see that right away, what could you do? Well, we could use the present value formula where we would say negative $100 today 
and one hundred five dollars divided by one to the r in the future that's really what the hundred five dollars is worth today right a hundred five divided by one plus r is what the money is worth today assume you know and our goal is to figure out what this interest rate is so to figure out what the interest rate is we would set this equation to zero we would just add up all the cash flows multiply them by the interest rate corresponding to what time in the schedule the cash flow either the cash either comes in or goes out and set the whole thing to zero and then solve for r another way to solve it would be to use the future value one year from today what would the negative hundred dollars be worth well a hundred dollars one year from today would be worth one plus the interest rate and then in the future a hundred five dollars is the future meaning one year from now a hundred five dollars one year from now is worth a hundred five dollars so either one of these equations could be used to solve for r and in both cases r would come out to be 0.05 would end up being five percent so what if we had a more mixed up version of, of uh, cash flows? Suppose we had this example. Oh, this is the one we, we did before, two slides earlier. Suppose you pay $300 today, you receive $500 one year from now, and then you have to pay $200 two years from now. This seems like a strange agreement you've made with somebody, but, you know, let's say it's possible. No, this is now not an investment because you paid money, then you received some money, and then you had to pay more. So technically it's not an investment. <clears throat> okay, what is the interest rate of this cash flow? We could use the future value formula or the present value formula. So we could say, from the point of view of two years from now, what is the $300 that we have to pay today worth? Well, if we tack on two years worth of interest, then $300, you know, might be, well, we don't, we don't know what the interest rate is, but let's say 15, you know, it could be, this could be like $340 two years from now. Then this 500 becomes 500 plus one year's worth of interest, and then the last payment, the negative 200, has no interest added to it. What interest rate would make this whole thing zero out and then solve for R. So is there like by inspection does this do what interest rate? Zero. Do, okay, so you're seeing zero because by inspection you see you're paying three hundred. I'm sorry, you're you're paying three hundred and you're paying two hundred and you're receiving five hundred. If the interest rate was zero, um, that would come out at zero. But is there anything else you could think comment on about the interest rate? Besides being zero, could it be another number too? Well, if, if we didn't see right away that it's zero, how would we solve this? We would take this formula and say minus 300 and minus 300 r squared. No, actually, we'd have to calculate 1 plus r squared. This would end up coming out a quadratic. And it is possible we could have two different interest rates that solve this equation. Zero definitely being one of them. Zero, it would come out to be negative 300 plus 500 plus 200 being zero, but we could have a second interest rate that would also solve this problem. And if the interest rate ever came out to be negative, we would consider that an invalid interest rate. But the bottom line is, could you see how we could have, let's say, maybe 10 payments, some positive, some negative? We're going to start having exponents 10, 9, 8, 7. And at this point, it might be better to use something like Excel to to figure out what the interest rate is. We'd have to type in kind of a large uh, formula to figure out what the implied interest rate is. So that's, this is typically called the internal rate of return, is the implied interest rate on a series of, uh, on a cash flow. So the cash flow in the craziest um, examples would be a mixture of positive and negative signs and the payments being made at random points in time on the schedule. So this would be, not, it's not necessarily an investment, but it's a business transaction where money is being exchanged over time. And you'd like to know what is the implied interest rate of that cash flow. We could calculate it, but once the exponents start getting like above two, we'd have to use some, you know, we'd have to write either software to solve it, or we could use, um, have you guys ever used goal seek in, uh, 
Excel? Well, okay, but does it make sense? Have you guys used Excel before? Okay, we could program the boxes to say like 300. We could have a box that says 300 plus, you know, open paren, 1 plus, and then we would have a box for R, and then say, you know, raise that to the second power, third power, fourth power, and then we could keep changing the value of R and seeing if it comes out to zero. And if it's not zero, we could lower it or raise it until we finally hit zero. But Goal Seek is a tool in Excel where you could say, I would like this box to be zero, search for me what the best R would do that. So we'll, we'll have a little class later on on how to use Excel, but we could use Excel to solve something like this if the payment stream got really long. But anyway, like I was saying, you could be given any cash flow, any combination of payments. You pay 300 today and I pay you 200 a year from now and then you pay me 600. Any, any any series of cash flows could have an implied interest rate in that. And we could calculate that rate. Okay. So that's that set. 